This is Early Medieval Embroidery and I'm Alexandra Makin and today we're on the next instalment of stitching. We're still on the outlines, stem stitch. Um, but taking into account um, some of the comments um, and questions that people left, thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, and actually, sidetrack, sorry, um, before we start, I can't believe so many people are, have been watching the first um, instalment of the stitching. Um, I, I thought it would um, be uh, interesting for some people, but not as many people who ha have watched it so far. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. The only problem for you now, of course, is you've been sucked into the black hole of early medieval embroidery and there is no escape, but it's a good place to be. Um, okay, so back on track. Um, so a number of people uh, said in the comments that they found it uh, difficult to hear what I was saying and I realised that that's because um, we don't have any funky equipment really. Um, I use my phone to record the videos and my phone was up behind me and my voice was projecting down here. So I've invested in a microphone and hopefully that will help the situation, fingers crossed. But please let me know if it's better, worse or no different. Um, also, a number of people uh, mentioned that they would like to be able to see the embroidery as it's being worked from above. I totally get that. Um, as I, we were editing um, the last video, I thought, oh, we should have been doing something like that. So um, I had to think about how to do this. And we are using um, the, this uh, machine here, the Ava, that I use for my um, online embroidery workshops. Uh, so we've got it set up and that's record, going to be recording um, from above as uh, my camera records down from the side. So hopefully you'll have a decent split screen and you can see the different angles and uh, um, cons um, focus in on what, you, what interests you. This is recording in HD. Um, now, my husband, who's more techie than me, has been talking about uh, frames per second and different rates and things. Don't ask me. Uh, but apparently it does film in HD, but it may not be as brilliant as if we were filming a movie or something along those lines. OK, so in this session, I'm going to carry on stitching. I'm going to try and answer questions that have been posed on the back of the last video. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so we're starting off uh, back where we left off last time. I haven't done anything in between. Um, I was I, partly because I was um, waiting to see what people wanted, really, how they wanted to view, how you wanted to view progress of the project. But here we go. Right, so we're starting uh, with more outline, more stem stitch. Um, we're working um, this circle here. Uh, here we go. I've got to remember to work on this outline bit on the outer edge of the um, line because that's not going to be covered by stitching. So I can't remember if this bit appeared in the um, original or whether it was in the section which uh, got which I thought I'd recorded and didn't. But I was talking at one point about um, the direction of work and that on the Bayer Tapestry, all the stem stitches work from uh, top left to bottom right. That's the diagonal um, line that the thread makes when it's been worked into the stitch. And that um, in the 19th century, what would be the Victorian era um, in, uh, in Britain, um, they started to compartmentalise everything and to um, give things specific names. Um, and I said I would look up which version of the stitch is named after what. So, and it turns out that if the stitch lies as it does here on the bare tapestry, uh, top left to bottom right, um, in books that have been published since the ninth, from the 19th century onwards, this is now called outline stitch. Uh, whereas if the um, diagonal line lies from top right to bottom left, 
it will be called stem stitch. Um, so little tidbit there. However, me being me, I'm going to continue to call it stem stitch because that's what um, uh, I've been doing for a long time. But also because there's no evidence that I've found so far for um, from going back as far as we are to between 415 1100 um, CE. We think that the bear tapestry was made in about 1070. Um, that stitches were um, had such specific names, you know, that if the direction of the angle of the thread was different, then they completely changed the name of the stitch. But also, we don't really have any evidence that stitches had um, uh, specific names, I suppose. Um, standardized, that's what I'm looking for, standardized names um, as um, we do today. Um, so, and I think that standardization probably came in when um, printing presses uh, were able to produce um, pamphlets and books and things um, that were more widespread and um, and therefore these standardized, the standardization process began. And then obviously in the 19th century, it became, um, I don't want, an obsession? Did it? Was it an obsession? Maybe. So there we are. Um, Elizabeth Coatesworth, Betty, um, has done um, published an article in that brilliant journal series, Medieval Clothing and Textiles, on uh, the name of stitches from Opus Anglicanum, so the the, um, the gold work technique that became popular um, from the 12th century onwards. And um, her work has shown that actually a lot of stitch names were, were, were not standardized, they were different. They appear um, in different documentary sources and things. On, um, but if you trace them back, through you can work out that they were what type of stitches they actually meant to represent and a lot of the names are quite descriptive and this fits in actually with something I was looking at recently um, about how in the early medieval period in particular names and um, the way things were described were quite uh, were based on people's sensory perceptions of the world around them, the environment around them. And you can see at one minute, just check this design. Uh, yep, yeah, I think that's okay. All right, so we'll move on to the next bit. We'll just take this thread along the back here. That should get caught by, there we go, start a new thread. We're gonna move down to this bit here now. Uh, and that is, ooh, mixture. Right, so these bits here are in blue, and then but this little bit at the top here is in brown. So we'll do this brown bit first, and then we'll go back to the blue. Um, yeah, so you notice that these stitches are, um, are quite descriptive terms, like they look like feathers of whatever bird or the colour um, and if they're describing the colour um, ravens feathers and things like this this type of thing so um, I think the way people looked and therefore named and described stitches particularly that far back was very different to how we um, perceive and name and describe them today uh, which is interesting in itself, I think. Wow, right. here we go. Next thread. Anyway, that's a long-winded answer about the angle of stem stitch versus outline stitch today. Right. So I think if you remember in the last video, I said that the original embroidery, the threads are started with knots, um, not the little casting on stitches that uh, we tend to use today. Um, I'm just looking at the picture again. Okay, we're going to start here. There. No, here. That's more like it. There we go. 
Um, so yeah. Now, somebody, oh, I'm so sorry. I was going to try and remember everybody's uh, names of YouTube and I apologize because I'm terrible with names anyway. And um, I should have written them down on my hand like you used to do if you were cheating at a test at school. Not that we ever did anything like that. But um, or somebody was asking, what was it suggested? as well as us, why didn't I, when I wanted my thread um, to untwist, in the last video I was unthreading it and un doing it by hand on the top, why didn't I just let that needle hang underneath the um, embroidery and untwist that way, that's what they would do. Um, and this, this person was from, oh, Nova Scotia in Canada. So um, thank you for that comment. Now normally that's exactly what I would do. Uh, however, when I was doing um, the embroidery last time, I was very conscious that people might want to see the processes and that um, if it was the thread was lying underneath, well, hanging, sorry, underneath, that A, you wouldn't be able to see it very well. But also, because of the way I was sat with my frame um, and the camera is recording up here, that if the, th the needle did happen to drop off the thread, and you're right, normally it wouldn't because um, the fibres um, are quite uh, rough in certain respects and so should, should hold um, the needle in place. Um, but if, it d if that did happen and the needle fell off, it, would be, it was going to be a bit of a nightmare trying to stop everything, pick it up and... Um, and work it like that. So that's the reason I was um, untwisting the thread that particular way um, in that uh, previous video. But as you have brought that up and highlighted, then I will do it the normal way, uh, normal way uh, from now on. Uh, so yeah. However, that doesn't help it if your needle then just comes out, your thread just comes out of your needle as you're going. Anyway, let's get this threaded through. Some people have said in the past, not on videos, but just, oh, oh threading it, your yarn through a round hole in the needle is so much easier than threading it through one that looks like an eye. I'm like, mm. In this particular instance, I'm not sure I necessarily agree. Sometimes it works, but not always. Nope, I'm gonna to have to cut the end. One minute. And like I said in the last video, my personal thing is I hate, um, no, hate's a strong word. I dislike licking the ends of threads for various reasons. And we were actually were taught not to at the RSN, um, but you get um, the saliva gets caught and uh, and then gets caught in your needle eye as well. So, but I'm not saying don't do that. If that's what you do, then you know that's fine. It's everyone's individual choice. Here we go. We're back up and running. Um. So a couple of people also. This is not embroidery. Um, linked, sorry. Um, a couple of people mentioned my jumper in the last video. So I'm a bit of a knitaholic. I love really nice knitwear and I love knitwear that's a little bit different but not too zany or out there. And I knitting is my relaxing thing, my hobby. So it takes me ages to make anything. But um, that pink jumper, yes, I did make that one myself. Uh, and it's from a magazine oh, called Lane, L-A-I-N-E. I can't remember which uh, volume it is. It's a few years old now. Uh, but that's the, um, the uh, that's that jumper, and I love it. It's so warm and toasty. And it's also just that little bit quirky as well with the pattern and everything. When I was working on it, I hadn't realised the armholes were quite so far down the jumper as they are, but um, you get used to it. 
So yeah, so that's um, that was the knitting pattern. All right. So you may notice that when I go around these sharp corners here, sometimes my stitches vary in size. And that's because I'm trying to get a nice, neat um, angle on these stitches. And um, because the filling stitch is going to be on this side, not on the outside, which could be, um, if it was on the outside, it could then be used to push that outline back into place. Um, so I'm using um, the smaller stitches to go around these uh, angles to try and give that nice neat edge. Um, and when I, the areas I've looked, I've studied on the Bayer Tapestry, I mean, I've not managed to study all of it, I think that would be a lifetime's work, but the areas that I have studied, you do find that sometimes the, the stitch lengths do cha uh, then um, change length they're not as um, standardized necessarily as uh, we would be told they have to be today um, and you can understand that i mean it doesn't just have to be about the design you might not be having a good day you might not really want to be doing stem stitch you might want to be doing another stitch might be nice weather and you want to be running around out there but you're not lots of reasons sorry i'm doing my whole wittering thing again no my need threads come out there we go i've just sneakily threaded my needle again so you probably won't have seen that Now this bit does a bit of a funny wiggle. Let me check. Oh, it's not really a funny wiggle. It's just a beautiful curl. So what you won't know is, um, this is because um, I mentioned it um, on the bit that didn't record properly, is that there's just some, I think there's just something fantastic about um, circles. And when you manage to draw or stitch a lovely circle, it's just really satisfying. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect or anything like that, but it, there's just something really nice about um, curls and circles and swirls different to straight line shapes. Um, let's try and get this one nice as well. It's a bit tight. So with this as well, what we can, what we'll probably do when we're stitching the filling is instead you won't work round it. You will work underneath and through it, and that's what will um, give make it stand out as well and fit it into into place. Oof, we've got a gap, so I'm going to do a sneaky cheat here. And bring the needle up and I just slot it in there and then that will work no one will know the difference except us and we won't tell anyone there we go uh, right so take that down here that will get caught by the fillings and things and we're back onto the blue. So two lots of brown thread at 40 centimeters so far. And we've done over just over 15 minutes of stitching. I am, I know I'm a bit slow. It's because of, well, there's a various reasons for it. I've got excuses for everything you'll find. Um, that obviously today the threading isn't going very quickly threading in the needle but also I'm very conscious that you are watching and you want to see what's happening and so um, there's that side of things but also and I found this when I was doing the uh, Cuthbert Manipal recreation project because I'm not thinking about the colours and things that I'm 
I'm not sorry. I'm, it's not that I'm not thinking. I'm not stitching colours and things as I perhaps I would do it myself. I'm having to refer back to um, the publications and the images of the originals. That that kind of slows me down a little bit. Um, so that's one reason why it's a bit slower. But by the time we get to the other side where we repeat this pattern, you never know, it might be a lot quicker. So we're starting at the top here and I'm doing my usual um, little extra stitch that will never really be noticed, but it just slots underneath the worked thread and means that this line here will come out and it will look as if it flows out of um, the previous row and that should be quite nice sorry my trestle has waggled over let me just move my trestle a bit and then um, there we go oh let's see if that helps there we are it does a bit no because my arm let's get my arm So obviously I'm working on um, trestles and a frame and um, the evidence, for, as I said in the earlier video videos, the evidence for these things um, from our period is very slight because obviously they're made of wood and that doesn't survive well in the archaeological record. But we do have some, uh, well one possible um, image of um, an embroiderer um working on a tress on a frame um ooh. oh what's gone off here oh it's called the other thread oh that's so irritating isn't it let's see can we undo it yes we can it's always a way around these things um and that person is leaning against what looks like a chest of drawers actually um, it probably has a particular name that I don't know about um, so we know that embroiderers were using um, similar type of equipment to what we use today and um, as well so that's quite and that's one of the things that this project, I'm trying to be as rigorous as possible um, with regards to the equipment and the materials and things that we're using to create, recreate this. Because it's not about a quick win or a quick fix, It's um, which I know is probably a bit unusual in today's world. Um, it's, and it's not about the finished product looking beautiful or um you know or being worthy of being in a gallery or anything like that it's about what we can learn about the working methods of um early medieval embroiderers but also sorry just checking the next bit yep okay early medieval embroiderers but also um their thought process processes their choices and how the materials and um top left bottom right how the materials and equipment worked and the experience that they had as well so this is why um we're using these materials and and this is a slow project really it's a bit like slow tv do you have slow tv in america in um, the UK, we've had um, slow TV programs for a while. I think we got them over from, um, is it North, the Scandinavian countries, maybe Norway, I think. And um, yeah, they've become really popular. We, there was a really good one the other Christmas where we were basically sat on a sleigh as um, a lady from the Same culture, uh, 
just went about her daily business and it was just fantastic. So maybe this is what this is going to be a bit like. Right, here we go, let's move that out of the way. Let's move that this way, there we go. Um, however, having said all that, obviously this is going to take hours and hours and hours do you want to sit and watch hours and hours and hours of stitching um and i know people have said that they they really enjoy it and they find it calming and relaxing which is brilliant because i find it quite calming and relaxing to actually do it as well or are you okay with me do you want, well, basically what I'm asking, do you want to see absolutely every single step and every single stitch or are, in meal time? Or are you okay with me doing bits in between and then coming back to you and saying, I've basically done more stem stitch, but not moving on to anything new without you. Let me know what you think to that. Uh, I will be guided by your thoughts. I think we're going to have to chop this one. It's getting in the way. There we go. Are we on screen? There we go. It keeps moving. Uh, let's see. One or two. I think we can get two more in there. Yeah. fibres from the um, linen are oh, sometimes popping through the holes to the front so that's what I keep pulling off there we go um next bit yeah still in the blue I'm just going to bring the thread up to see if it's okay to carry on using or if we should start a new thread so at these points, I'm kind of torn because my apprenticeship taught me that you should, um, with every new section, you should start a new thread. And in the modern day world, yeah, that's to I totally get it. Um, and, you know, we've got an abundance of thread and things. But I've just said that we're trying to be rigorous in, in our experiment. And there wouldn't necessarily have been such an abundance, well, there wouldn't have been such an abundance of threads and they would have been extraordinarily expensive um, in in the um, 1070s. So this is why I'm kind of like, oh, do, I'm torn. Do I carry on with this or do I leave it? I think, I think we might be able to carry on a little bit. Let's see how we go. So... It's funny how you do an apprenticeship or training of any sort, really. And, um, I mean, I went down and started my apprenticeship at 18. So you're kind of, your brain and the, your way of thinking is moulded by um, this training. Well, as it should be, really. But it's, it's funny how then, so many decades, I'm not going to tell you how many, later, um, you still think like that and you really have to make an effort to change that thought process and to think somewhat differently and for me particularly because we're uh, you know I'm looking at embroideries worked a, a long time ago it's kind of like I feel from an academic point of view as well as from a practical I often think I really have to have an academic-ish re reason to explain that as well. Oh, the sun's come out. Let me just check this bit. Uh, yeah, straight across. Okay, that's fine. Um, so I live in the northwest of England, which is a fantastic place to be. I would say that, but it is, honestly. Um, 
sorry, let me just check that line. It does go up like that, okay. Um, but we have had so much rain recently, it's ridiculous. And um, it's just nice to see the sun come out for a bit, even if it's only for a bit. And it also makes a massive difference to um, the light for stitching, as you will all be aware. Um, so the room I'm in at the moment uh, has got a lot of window space. Um, sorry, so just to interrupt my thoughts here. This line here, um, I haven't drawn on, but on the original, it is there, so this is why I'm actually incorporating um, the stitching in. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this room is great because it has um, a lot of light coming in from, all, from different directions, so that's fantastic. Um, but the other thing is, as well, the quality of light is so much better in here than it would be in a lot of... Um, other rooms that I have access to um, for stitching and things. I also find, oh, how stupid was that? I'll just thread this, need full concentration. Nope, not happening. Let's cut a bit off the end. Um, I also find um, and I know I've said this in other videos and actually in conference papers and things that working outside um, under um, a, a shelter of some sort or even in summer, even working um, just outside, the, light, the quality of light compared to being indoors, even in here, is fantastic. The difference is amazing. Um, and whereas, I mean, for this, I don't need a magnifying glass, but for things like silk and gold work, I often need a magnifying glass. But then I find working out, oh, this is annoying. I will find working outside, I don't need it. My stitching still looks fine. So, yeah. Okay, managed to rethread my needle. Um, you may wonder why you're not seeing all these rethreadings happening. It's because uh, every so often we have to stop recording and then restart it again because um, transferring the video from my phone to my laptop um, it's not always very happy if we um, transfer over huge data files uh, so that's why sometimes you'll see um, in one se in one second there's no thread in the needle and the next second there is Okay, we're getting on a roll. I will stop this thread as it hits the next line at the T junction. We're getting there. So I think what, oh no, oh, irritating. There we go. So what I was about to say was, obviously we're doing stem stitch outline um, on this bit uh, because, sorry, on this bit on first, because on the um, original hanging, the evidence on the back where you can work out which stitches were worked when because of the way the threads split uh, previously worked stitches or lie over the top of, um, stitch of, um, of them, it shows that the... Um, outlines will work first throughout most of the motifs that I've managed to study so far. Uh, so 
that's why we've been working um, and this area is heavily restored on the original um, so that's why we've gone with working the outlines first and the filling second look at that that threaded straight away yes right we won't question it um but i realize that if you're watching this watching well it will be more than two a number of episodes or video episodes videos where all i'm doing in stem stitch could be a little bit mind numbing let me just check the picture uh yep yeah, we're okay um so what we might do is because we've now got a couple of areas up here for instance where they're enclosed spaces now as in the outlines contain the filling areas we could actually if you want to start on some oops, start on fillings on the next video so let me know what you think to that idea but if you're happy for me to continue doing the stem stitch all the way down i will do so um oh, i've just realized i've done that wrong oh that's annoying isn't it there we go um can i pull that out is it going to be play ball? Yes, there we go. Um, obviously, I won't fill in areas that haven't been completed by outline first. Um, because that's not the game. That's not how it was done. And like I said, we're trying to be rigorous. Here we go. That's better. So the reason I've just undone that is because I realised that although I was creating a beautiful curve, and you know how much I like curves, um, it wasn't covering the outline stitch very well. And um, you've got to do both, really. So that's what we're doing. Although I've just realised, oh, blimey, shows how my brain's working today. Both these areas on left and right would have been filled with filling, so it would have been fine. Oh, honestly, sometimes I do wonder. Anyway, let's just relax. Calming session. In fact, I'm going to cut this bit off now. Oh, now I just remember somebody mentioned uh, that could they, um, I don't know if it was for this video or the one where I was transferring the fabric, but I'll answer it here and I will write a, a comment in the comments box below to answer as well, um, in, if it's a different video, uh, about transferring the pattern onto the design onto the ground fabric. So I'm just shifting a bit here. Um, could they have used stamps? Um, much like you see uh, workers in India and, and places like that where they, they're stamping these beautiful and elaborate designs onto, um, onto hangings and, bed, and bedding and things like that. And do you know what? That's a really interesting idea that I've never contemplated or thought about. I don't know why. I'm just checking the design again. Um, and I don't think anybody else has, to my knowledge. So there are a couple of implications about um, type of materials uh, that they would have been able to make these stamps out of, whether pigments uh, would have worked in that way, being painted onto a stamp and then pressed over. I don't know. So I'm going to talk to a couple of people I know uh, Two I've mentioned a lot before. So uh, one is an Adam, who you may know as Blue Axe. Whoop. He uh, does the most amazing um, uh, recreations of early medieval 
um, objects uh, across um, not textile things but metalwork and and um, other other objects they're um, abs- they're beautiful the, and the accuracy with which with which he creates them is um, um is amazing really so um i will put a link to his um channels actually for you check him out his his work's fantastic um so he may have ideas but also my um amazing weaver liz uh she is also a painter there are no end to her skills and she has uh, worked on creating frescoes and things in churches um using traditional uh, methods and things like that so she may have some thoughts about that sort of thing too so i'm going to um well liz if you're watching this email me tell me your thoughts and if she's not watching this i will i will contact her and find out what she thinks she also um contacted me on the back of the video where I transferred the design onto the fabric and she came up with a number of really interesting points um, on the back of some comments that I made in that. The reason I've not passed these on yet is because um, I literally emailed her the other day um, asking a couple more questions on the back of her answers and um, and I was wondering if she actually wanted to come if she wanted me to pass them on through a video or if we would do it by another means, which I'm not going to tell you about yet because she's not replied and I won't want to uh, make her feel that she has to do one or the other. So I will keep you posted on that, on her replies because they were very interesting. Right, I'm just doing my little extra stitch again that I always tend to do just to make my night my line look neat and I'm just lifting my the frame up because the trestle is under this bit here um making it a bit awkward there we go now my trestles are placed as they are um obviously because of the length of the frame the width of the frame sorry has to balance the frame properly but also because um my design goes up very close to the edge of the fabric that wouldn't have been the case um well it the design would have gone up to the, did go up to the edge of each panel on the Bayer tapestry, um, but they left gaps between um, the the end, edges of what they were stitching and the edges of the panels. And then once the panels were joined together, they stitched over the top of them. So it's a slightly different um, situation. And also, I'm very I'm trying to keep everything in focus for. Um, so that you can see what I'm actually working on nicely. Right, now I'm just gonna have to pause a minute because I've got a runny nose, which is really bad. And of course my tissues are all the way over there. Oh, I found a scrap, here we go. All right, excuse me. There we go, sorted. Right, back to work. carry on down here sorry this bit's just taking um, a bit of time because of the trestle underneath there we go sorted oh I better just check this is blue isn't it it is we're fine everything's fine Now this is a nice long length of beautiful curving sinuous line so I should in theory get a bit of a roll on here get in the zone And I'm going to do what was just before and leave the needle hanging to untwist underneath. Hopefully, no, it's not coming off. That we seem to be doing okay. Let's see if that's made a difference. It didn't look as if it was untwisting very much at all, really. Sometimes you can really tell. That would be okay. Okay. 
oh, that was the other thing um, that I talked about in the last video and it didn't get recorded. So um, before I started recording the first um, Stitch video, the last one, um, I actually went around and tightened up the lacing that attaches the the fabric to the frame. Um, the fabric has been on the frame for quite a while. Um, I, I had a few months gap in between each of the previous videos because, well, such a lot of work on with everything else um, meant that um, a family um, responsibilities and things meant that I was um, having to leave larger gaps between videos than I wanted to but anyway um, so as people who embroider will know um, oh, when you're working on a piece and it's attached to a frame over time the, the lacing um, stretches the fibers stretch with it um, on, as they're under tension um, and also um, the fibers within the fabric they they alter as well and um, it the results in the fabric itself um, becoming looser on the frame so you haven't got that same tension that you really um, need and your fabric should really sound like a, a drum when um, you tap it and this fabric is failing that experiment at the moment, but we won't worry about that because it's fairly tight at the moment. Um, and so every so often you will see embroiderers going around their frames, tightening up the lacing. And I did that um, on this before I did the last, I started recording the last video. And in fact, actually I should have probably have recorded it, but um, I can do that next time. But I was really pleased. So I'm just hoiking the frame over a bit. I was really pleased with um, that the lacing hasn't pulled massive holes in um, in the fabric. You will find that people today, when they are working um, on pieces on a frame, when they lace up, they will put a band of webbing, a band of tape down the side and then they will lace through that and that um, there's a number of reasons for that um, it's about protecting the edge of the fabric but it's also um, about giving um, extra attention th um, through it as well and then the one at the, along the top people now you would fold over the edge of your fabric and you would attach it to this webbing here which in the framing up episode I explained why I'm not doing that um, and you would stitch it to that and then this webbing here takes the strain and the tension not your um, I'm just gonna I think I'm gonna cast off this thread um, not um, the ground fabric itself and so that keeps the integrity of the ground fabric and the weave um, and means you don't end up with massive holes in it um, we have no evidence from imagery of um, early uh, sort of early embroidery frames, but this is obviously later than our period of them using things like webbing. So I went down the route of lacing up, um, as I explained in that that video, the framing up video of lacing up without using the webbing, and I was a little concerned that um, the about what the reaction between the two the thread and the ground fabric would be um, as the tension um, continued over I, what I knew would be a number of months at least. So it was very it's very interesting that um, oh not large enough not it's very interesting that the um, the ground fabric hasn't got massive holes in it from the tension also that the linen thread because we use cotton today the linen thread is holding up so well although you can see it's very fibrous um, as it's um, taking the strain let's see if that lot's bigger better 
Um, and I have, I have to admit, been very tentative in um, tightening up and um, not pulling perhaps as tightly as is possible because, I, well, it's all an experiment within an experiment, isn't it? As always with these things. Um, so, yeah, it's quite interesting, really. Oh, now, for just a reminder that obviously we're doing stem stitch and the stitches overlap each other. So when you finish off one thread, you leave it hanging, you cast on your new thread, bringing it up at the starting point, and then you create your last stitch with the old thread. And you can then take, uh, we'll go down, just, we'll go down to here. You can then pull your thread up um, like that. And that um, that's how you add your new thread to the fabric. And I need to check actually on the on the original bear tapestry that that is actually what they were doing but the evidence um because i haven't looked at that in detail i've just assumed it which is really bad form but the evidence from the front suggests that that's what they were doing most of the time because there are no gaps um between stitches um when they finish one thread and start another. Now, I mean, that's not consistent. There are some areas where there are small gaps and you can see that they've started a new thread. But the majority of the time, there aren't, as far as I'm aware. I need to go and look at that. That's another research project. Um, so, yeah, there we go. There's one line. Oh, that's a bit wobbly, isn't it? We'll see if we can push that in and out as needed. As we go. Uh, right, where to next? Okay, I'm going to go up this side now because this bit here um, on the picture it looks like it's been worked in one. So we're going to go up this side, capture the end. Um, I know somebody commented about length of thread um, being used uh, because I said I use 40 centimetres because I find that, that when you're working stitches like this that go through the ground fabric quite a lot and therefore wear on, on the fibres of the thread, that length seems to work well before you, the thread deteriorates too much. And um, a person commented about the Marseille embroideries. Um, I know the article that you cited. I've just got to go back to it to double check the answer on that. I think, though, that also, because the Marseille embroideries are worked um, in silk on uh, linen, that the wear is, is going to be um, is going to be different to um, that of wool threads. But we will double check and I will come back to you with all of that. Okay, so we're just doing up here. And I think what we might do is we'll get to the end here and then we will, we might stop for a bit. Okay, so we'll get to the end here and see how we're looking. I think we've done about 40 minutes at the moment. Uh, we might be able to get started on this bit here. Just very conscious, I don't want to bore any of you. Okay, I think I'm going to leave the thread hanging on this one just to let it unravel a bit. There we go, some twisting. Perfect. 
Oh, sorry, I should explain merely what happened, what the process and dynamics are involved in that. So basically, when you're working, when you have a thread, these threads are what we call plied. So there are two lengths of thread where the fibres have been twisted together to make longer lengths of yarn. Um, that's called twisting or spinning. Um, and then... Um, if you want a thicker thread, so many lengths of the of the yarn, the spun yarn, are then twisted, plied together. Um, so in this instance, we've got two. Two threads are plied together to make a slightly thicker thread. And you can see from the way they've been twisted, hopefully you can see that it's in what we call an S direction because the, di the way they cross is like the middle band of an S and it can be an S or a Z, but in this instance, it's an S. When you're working, you're stitching, you're th the th you are twisting the thread you won't notice that you're doing it, but as you twist your needle, as you're creating the stitches, you, your thread can twist tighter or untwist, making it looser. And I mean, you can see that in process here, the way it's all twisting around itself. And that can mean that the, um, the thread, the two th lengths of yarn that have been plied together separate out um, and or tighten up, altering how the yarn looks, feels and acts when you're working it. So um, to counteract all of that, to get your yarn back to its naturally applied state, you can leave it hanging um, and the weight of the needle acts and enables it to um, to untwist slightly or twist back up uh, back to the na the natural plied state. So that's the process that I'm undertaking when I'm using me doing that. I'll try again as well because you can see it's getting all a bit wrapped around itself. There we go. Oh, that was one of the other things. So my husband was, um, who's very enthusiastic about this project, um, was one thinking that maybe at some point we should do a live session. Uh, um, he would be in here as well because then if anyone was asking questions or commenting, he would be able to let me know what people uh, were asking and I could answer your questions and, we, um, and comments and things. Uh, live as we did some stitching um, let me know what you think to that I find that idea really quite scary because uh, it's warts well I mean this is fairly warts and all anyway but it's kind of like if something goes horribly wrong and it's not live you can kind of sort it out whereas if it's live that's it everybody knows straight away um, but let me have your thoughts on that and if people are interested let me just see where this line goes yep we're on track um, if people are interested um, in me doing that then oh we will um, we will look into it and work out the best time also if you are interested um, you might need to let me know kind of whereabouts in the world you are because we'll need to get the timings right um, to enable people to join um, but obviously, if uh, I do this at a, a certain time, GMT time, and um, you're in, um, oh gosh, there's a big bumblebee just flying past. That's beautiful. Um, and you're, uh, I don't know, in the South Pacific somewhere, 
and so the timings are really off then obviously we'll upload the video as well uh, let's check let's start this bit oh we're back on the, the brown um, and so then although it, you will still be able to ask questions and things but afterwards um, yeah so let me know about that um, we can go from there we can try and sort something out <laughs> however if we're doing it live and we've got both these set cameras set up for the different angles i have no idea how we'll work that out but we'll get there as you can see i'm not i can use tech if it works and does what i want it to do easily but if it's complicated that's another it's another level fortunately my husband is more tech savvy than me so between the two of us we can work it out but i tend to stick to my early medieval stuff and printed books and stitching and knitting and things like that so it's a happy place to be there we go right big knot let me just check whether to start here here or here um Oh, okay, we're actually starting down here. Yeah, so we start here, we walk all the way around to this bit, and then we work these bits afterwards. And the reason I know that is I'm not looking at um, the back on this particular because as I said this bit's been restored so um, it's not always um, use, helpful to look at the back but I'm using I'm looking at images of the front in the David M Wilson book that brilliant big sized book and um, you can see that the way the stitches and the lines interact with each other you can work out which was worked um how they were worked uh, so you can see that this outline was all worked in one bit and then this next bit was worked and then finally or at the beginning this horizontalish line was worked without looking at the back you can't tell if that was worked first or last because the way these stitches have been angled underneath the other lines but you can tell it's that it's been worked separately to um to the rest of it so that's what we're going with i hope that made sense that made sense in my head but I've literally just thought about it and I'm like, mm, not sure if that came out of my mouth making sense. Hopefully it did. But if not, let me know because I can draw diagrams and talk through the diagrams. Right, now, my inclination on these bits, if I was designing my own piece, my own kit, is to then do a stitch up here and then we kind of restart your line down here to get a nice sharp point. But they don't do that. Oh no, it's going to just be... Oh, my brain is going, what are you doing? You're not going to, oh, you're not going to get your nice sharp point. Okay. Isn't it funny how everyone's brain works slightly differently? And some people are quite happy working it like this and others aren't. It's just not going to, okay, I'm just going to have to ignore it because I'm not going to be happy with it no matter what. And because it's an angle, oh, actually, it's not too bad, is it? Okay, right, I take a bit of it back. But because the angle, the filling is worked on this side, on the wider part of the angle, not the narrow part, you can't point 
push it back in with a filling either. Okay, it's not looking too bad at the moment. So the other um, uh, thing you can do in areas like that, of course, is not pull these stitches too tight. But you don't want to leave them too loose because then they'll look all bubbly but um, and bulky. But if you don't put, if you pull them too tight, it can pull them in too much, and then they don't look right either. Um, so it's about learning about your time your tension as well and what works with in this instance wool thread on linen um so yeah right so we're just going to carry on okay let's see if we can speed up a bit we should be able to, shouldn't we? She says. Hmm. So I think what we will do is... Oh, Ooh, doesn't it just annoy you when somehow or other your thread gets, you ends if your thread get caught like that? How does that happen? Oh, anyway. Well, it's not annoying, it's just frustrating. And it's like, how does that happen? Anyway, right, sorry, back to, um, I think what we will do is finish the outline of this swirly bit. So all of this bit. And I think then that will be, about an hour, maybe just over. I need to check it because I'm, um, as I said in the last video, I am timing myself and I am um, noting how many thread, how much thread and things I use as well because that has, by learn, see, this is one of the cool things about experimental projects is that you can then use this information to extrapolate out not just the amount of thread and time that can be high, that we can say was used on the bare tapestry but actually all the background that goes into that as well so how how much yarn would you have got from a sheep how many fleeces would you have needed then how long would it have taken to spun the yarn? The dyeing times and processing involved, and therefore the number of possibly the number of people involved, and things like this. The amount of information you can get just from making sure you keep accurate time timings and amounts of threads and things you use, and the number of needles you use and things is phenomenal, really. Oh, now, in the last video, I was um, complaining about the thread, the brown thread, and um, I didn't record. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. But, and I said at the end, it was about the quality. It's not about the quality. That was the wrong word to use. It's about the fact that this thread, I, I don't know if it's the, the dyes that have been used. I think I'm going to have to change threads. Um, different dyes affect fibers dif in different ways and so oh that threaded straight away yes if I, i'm really not happy that i'm going to undo some of these stitches um and so that's better go to that um i'm finding that this batch of the brown thread anyway um, I, I, and I'm saying this batch on purpose because, because other batches may be different. Um, the it doesn't seem to be as thick as the blue, and it doesn't seem to um, keep its structure as well as the blue when working it. Uh, so that's what I was. Um, going on about on 
the last video when it didn't record and, and then at the end I said oh I was moaning about the quality it wasn't the quality at all the quality of the threads is um fantastic it was the the structure of the thread and how it holds up when it's being worked oh, there we go I'll have to find out what they use to make these colours. I did ask actually a few years ago. I will go back to my um, conversation chain and find out. Because I do know a lovely person who, um, who dies, who used to grow the plants and then do a lot of dyeing herself. And um, I will ask her, you're probably, you may be watching this video. Hello, if you are, you know who you are. Um, she's in the northeast of England. And um, she may be able to tell me some interesting facts about how dyes react with plants, um, with wool fibres. Let me just check this. Yep, I need to stop here. I need to stop at this point and then work down from there. Um and whether they, I want to say eat away at them, I'm not sure that's the right terminology, but whether they, um, well, yeah, eat away at, at the, at the fibres as they're dyeing them, or change the, change the um, structure of them, chemical structure of the fibres a little bit. So I will find out the dyes, and then I will find, Let's try and get those questions answered and let you know the answers. Oh, we're getting that nice um, <laughs> sound as the needle comes up through the fabric. That is the sound of the right needle being used, the right size needle being used uh, on the right fabric. Oh, look, he's done that again. It's very, very irritating. Happens to me all the time. Okay. Oh, now I'm going to do one more of my little sneaky stitches. There we go. Um, now we're going to just do this last line along here. Oh, that's quite a nice curve as well, isn't it? It's quite satisfying to see. It's like when you draw hearts out and one side is beautiful curve at the top and the other isn't. Very um, irritating that. And sometimes with stitching, if it's just a little knobble or wobble, you can tweak it. But on other occasions, you really do have to undo it. Now, the question, of course, with regard to the bear tapestry is, was it made in a rush? Did they have time to do, undo things if they weren't happy? Did they care enough? Um, or were they under instructions? No, get it done. It doesn't matter if it's not quite as you 100% as you would want it questions that still need answers to. Right, I think that is a good place to stop for now. We've done quite a bit. I know it doesn't look a bit a lot in the grand scheme of things, but from a sewing point of view, and those of you who stitch will know where I'm coming from with this, we've actually done quite a lot today. We've done really well. So I'm going to leave that now. I mean, this is a, about an hour's work, worth of work. Um, I'm going to wait on and see what you think um, at, in the comment section. You know, 
do you want to see every single stitch in real time or are you okay with me perhaps doing the rest of this stem stitch and then coming back to you with the filling um I don't mind either way. It's absolutely fine. I will still do the timings. I will still be able to tell you how long it took and how many threads we used and things like this and, and any difficulties or positives and, and things. So um, either way, so that's fine. Um, do you want me in the next video to carry on with, uh, with the outline or do, do you want me to start some of the filling as well? Uh, because we can do these in closed spaces up here so just let me know your thoughts and then that will guide me as to how we proceed for the next episode or episode next video but in the meantime happy stitching and I hope you've enjoyed this video